And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed Reacts. Today, we're going to be covering the Philly mob. You guys have been covering, well, actually, you guys have been asking for this one for quite a bit. Uh, I got a little new intro for y'all. Let's get right into it, man. A special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. This is what Fed Reacts covers. Defender Jeffrey Williams and Associate Weissel did commit the felony. So here's what 6 9 actually got. Racketeer conspiracy. This attack shifted the whole U.S. government. This guy got arrested. Espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russians. John Wayne Gacy, a.k.a. the Killer Clown, okay? One of the most prolific serial killers of all time. Killed 33 people. Zodiac Killer is a pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who operated in Northern California. All these serial killers, guys, they really get off on getting attention from the media. Many years, Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploited and abused dozens of minor girls at his home. It was OJ working together to get Nicole killed. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. Cool. Let me know how y'all like that new intro, man. Made some adjustments, you know, talked about the different cases that we cover. Um, it's not two minutes long, so I don't want to hear any complaints. Uh, but as you guys know, I'm here with my partner in crime as usual. Uh, Angie, why don't you introduce yourself to the people? Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, this is Angie. Um, you guys have seen me for a while here. I just want to address something. Um, I kind of want to apologize for my attitude of the last episode because I was being annoying and, like, corny and also um, moody. I was very moody because I didn't like the case. And, yeah, I just want to apologize because I was being stupid. So, yeah. I also want to address... Stupid. Yes, stupid. Stupid for two. Um, yeah, I was very really, like I was just being like annoying because I was annoyed with the case, which is like it doesn't have anything to do with you guys. Um the 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 documentary was good. I, d I just didn't like didn't like the case. Anyways, in my opinion, I was just being like retarded. Uh, and also in this in this internet world you take five saves and then you take like six back, so it's fine. Um I also want to address some rumors that you guys have been saying, like, I've been, I'm married. I've never been married. I've, I'm not married right now. Like, and that's just some stupid you guys took out of content uh, on another video because I was I was saying something about my dad and I made them say, saying my has instead of saying my dad has. So, yeah, you took us as I was saying, like, husband. But, yeah, I'm not married. That's it. Cool. There you go. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they got that out. There she goes. Uh, female taking accountability, man. So that is amazing right there. I'll give her a Don DeMarco for that one. Don DeMarco. Because she realizes she fucked up and she was like, yeah, let me, let yeah, me I got to I gotta make this right. So, hey, man, you know, we all make mistakes. No one is perfect. So it is what it is. And uh, to her defense, guys, she has been going through some things. She didn't want me to say that. I'm not going to say what it is, but some personal stuff. So, you know, it, you know, life happens, right? But, uh, but yeah, she definitely didn't mean to come up that way for you guys and me and her spoke about it off air so it won't be happening again don't worry guys yeah um, I, I do be reading your comments uh, like i read everything you guys write so i know i even like commented the video and i said yeah i know because i know i was being like stupid so yeah stupid again yeah there you go and, stupid <laughs> yeah but i hope you guys can like forgive me and yeah i won't do it again that's it and we like making these videos for you guys, man. And Angie does I put do, a good amount yeah. of work behind the scenes uh, for these cases. So she really cares, which is why she's emotional about it at times. So it is what it is. But she's a female, guys. You know what it is. You know, booking <laughs> stories right now. Why women deserve less? So you all already know. And she actually, uh, she's pretty much done translating it. So it's going to be out in Spanish very soon for y'all. But today, Yay. we're going to be covering something that you guys have been asking for for a bit, uh, yeah, for a while. Done. And this is something that she actually is interested in, which is the Italian mob out of uh, Philadelphia. Um, so I got a documentary here that we're going to be playing guys, um, from FBI files. Um, as you guys know, it's one of my favorite documentaries. Uh, it's, it's older, but it's good stuff. Um, and this covers the Philadelphia mafia and the Philly mob war it kind of wraps everything all up in one shot. So, mm -mm. uh, Angie, you got anything before I uh, get into this thing? Yeah, I really like this documentary. And there is another one that I, I, I sent to Martin to watch. If you guys want to check it out, it, it covers like the whole, it's in parts, though. I think it's four parts or two parts. I don't remember now, but I just watched, like, the first part. What's the name of it again, Angie? Uh, I think it's Mafia Crimes or something like that. Can it's... you find it real quick so we can put sure, it to sure, other people? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, she'll I find said, it for I know I sent it to you. It's really good, yeah, and it's, did. like, very informative. So if you guys want to... I'm kind of sad because we're, like, finishing the, the series of, like, Italian Mafia uh, that we covered already. Like, we're finishing, like, the whole playlist, and, like, we're not going to make... I mean, we can make more if we can, like, you know. Like, I think uh, maybe, if anything, I'll do one more. Ryan Dawson will recover yeah. the Italian mafia and intelligence agencies. At, but uh, yeah. that's pretty much going to be it. Because, I mean, how many episodes have we done now? Is this, like, we, seven or eight? Yeah, like, almost eight. Yeah. 
So yeah, and also um, I'm kind of hoping that um, uh, uh, Patrick. Patrick Bay Davis. We met him at the well. I met him. I already knew him at the Value Tamer uh, show that we had on Friday last Friday. And like, I'm a big fan of his content. I'm a big fan of him. And I, I managed to talk to him for a while. And he said like he could hook us up with uh, Sammy the Bull. Yes. So I'm kind of hoping we can get like an interview with him because that'd be also be so good for this channel. I mean, it's so good. Sammy the Bull is like. Uh, it was a great, like, it was a big monster. And we talked about him in more detail in the Gambino family yes. uh, documentary. As you guys know, he was basically the underboss for John Gotti when John Gotti took over as boss for yeah. the Gambino crime family. And Sammy the Bull famously testified against John Gotti, etc. So, yeah, it would definitely be interesting to get him on as well. Yeah, um, definitely. So, um, anything else before I get into this? No, um, just to check, you guys to check the playlist that we have on the channel. Because you're still asking for the same same cases that we already covered. So yeah, check out the playlist because um Yeah, Myron, it's nicely organized for y'all as well. Yes, Italian own, Mafia, 9-11, organized crime, national security cases, it's all there, guys. So yeah, make sure to uh definitely check it out. But um cool. Without further ado, guys, we will go ahead and get into today's episode, which is going to be the uh Philly Mob. All right, so uh let's get into it. A ruthless grab for power tears a city apart. A crime family splits in two as the young and the old fight to the death. The FBI is caught in the middle as they infiltrate the syndicate in a desperate attempt to end the brutal war raging on the streets of Philadelphia. of a bloody vendetta. The streets erupted in mob warfare. Authorities feared innocent people would be caught in the crossfire. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents launched a complex and risky surveillance operation. Their mission, to bring down a notorious crime family and to stop a brutal turf war before more people were killed. Nineteen ninety. A quiet morning in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Joe Andruzzi is being wired by the FBI. South Philadelphia, born and raised in the playgrounds where I spent most of my day. No, all jokes what? aside, guys. Uh that's Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, South Philadelphia, guys, is um, if you guys ever been to Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Uh, it's a uh, very st uh, strong Italian uh, population. Okay, North Philly is the hood. South Philly is the Italian stronghold. Um, so let's see here. We so we got a guy getting wired up by the FBI in oh, 1990. Wait, before you go into it, um, uh -huh. the documentary that I was talking about is called Philly Bob Documentary, and it's called it, this is on the channel Mob Talk News. Cool. Pretty you know cool. what? Since since we're on it anyway, go ahead and pull up that Wikipedia page you got up. We'll read this through real okay, quick for y'all. Sure. Give uh, you guys a quick little intro because uh, Angie pulled this up. We give you guys a little intro to the Philadelphia Mafia. Uh, which this documentary is going to cover in some parts. Uh, so we got here. Um, go ahead, Angie. You want to read it for them? Okay. Um, the Philadelphia crime family, also known as the Philadelphia Mafia, the Philly Mob or Philly Mafia. Um, I'm just going to, okay. Or Bruno Scarfo family is an Italian American mafia family based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know what's funny? I, uh, this is me being L, but like I thought Pennsylvania was another state. I didn't know Pennsylvania was a city in Philadelphia. No, no, Pennsylvania is another state. It is? You're right. Yeah. Pennsylvania is a state. Philadelphia is a city in that state. Oh, no, no, no. I, okay. The other way around. You thought yes. Pennsylvania was a city and Philadelphia yes. was a state. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Because, okay. I mean, I don't know. In that case, then. Uh, I don't know. The, stupid. Yeah, because I don't know, like, all the states in the United States. Like, I knew, I knew the names, but I, I wouldn't know, like, the capital of, of each state, like, the cities in each state. So, yeah, I was thinking me, me, silly me. I was thinking, like, yeah, Philadelphia was another state. Anyways, um says here, four men based in South Philadelphia, the, cri the criminal organization primarily uh, primarily operates in various areas and neighborhoods in Philadelphia, the greater Philadelphia metropolitan area, uh, 
i.e. I- I- the Delaware Valley, Valley and New Jersey, especially North, South S- Jersey. South Jersey. Uh, the family is notorious in, for its violence, due in particular to its succession of violent bosses and multiple mob wars. Which we're going to talk about here yes. in this episode, guys. So, so you um, know the name of Bruno Crime Family is the family of this. And if uh, you have anything else, Angie, uh, like that comes up, whatever, just let me know. Sure. Uh, but yeah, guys, uh, so let's get back into it. So you guys can see here, it's 1990 and FBI is wiring up this guy. I wonder why. Let's play the video real quick because I got some commentary on this. He's a 20-year-old accounting student at LaSalle University, and he's in trouble. Uh, LaSalle is a local university in Philadelphia, by the way. It sucks. I remember we raced them back at the Eastern Sprints in 2012, and we smashed them. Yeah, LaSalle sucks. (laughs) He's been betting on football through a mafia bookmaker. He was winning at first, but his luck turned sour. He owes the mob $1,000. Angie, look up what one thousand dollars was. Oh, she's already on it. Okay, okay. one thousand in nineteen ninety. Um, and as you guys know, the reason why this is uh, very relevant, guys. Nineteen ninety. Well, yeah, nineteen ninety. Yeah. So, and the reason why this is so relevant, guys, just so y'all know, is that the mafia, right, ran gambling rings back then. Uh, they still do now, but you know, the uh, sports betting was a big thing. If you guys don't believe me, watch the interview that we did with Michael Francis, where he details this, where he was running um, uh, a bunch of. He had a bunch of. Uh, bookmakers that he, he was uh presiding over that basically you know ran these illegal gambling rackets and uh the mafia controlled that guys especially in philadelphia so if you don't pay the money yeah you know there ain't gonna be forget about it they're definitely <laughs> gonna remember it and they're gonna come after you so you gotta pay the money that you're owed and in this case he owed a thousand dollars um in sports betting uh, uh what is right that? now it's uh 2300 wow today yeah. it's over doubled mm-hmm. 23 years later so uh let's get back into it guys it's a debt he cannot pay. You understand? I don't think you do, so. I don't think you got it at all. Because you understand what's going on. In way over his head and afraid for his life, Andrucci contacted the FBI and asked for help. It's money, kid. South Philly is a tough place. And this actually, guys, happens quite a bit. I remember when I was an informant, there was so many times. When I was an informant, LOL, my bad. Ooh. Stupid. When I was an agent, informants would come to me all the time, guys, saying, hey, uh, you know, this guy's going to kill me if I don't pay back this debt. Or these guys want to get rid of me, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the times, informants will come to you as a last resort through um, desperation that they're about to be killed. I remember that story I tell you guys all the time about that Sicario that talked about people that, people that he would kill. For the bosses and the Zetas, how he would like, you know, cut off fingers and stuff like that. And he would get a bonus for every person that he killed. I think I've told that story before. But either way, he came to us providing information because they wanted him gone, guys. So um, sometimes you get some of the best informants when they're put, uh, when they're between a rock and a hard place uh, because they don't have a choice. So they come to law enforcement. Um, That's uh, a great situation for you to be as, as an agent, as a controlling agent. Go ahead. My, so uh, now that we're talking about your experience, a lot of people have been asking me to break down like a case of yours. I don't know if you can do it. Yeah, we can. We definitely can. I've just been kind of waiting because one of the cases that I uh, have, um, it's actually going to get a Department of Justice award from the Attorney General very soon. Uh, I'm going to reach reach out to one of my old colleagues and see right. if I can if I can do it. That'd be great. Because it might still be active. It deals with Sri Lankan and national Sri Lankan smugglers and Sri Lankan smugglers. Sri, Sri Lankans. Yeah, it's a very. Are there Sri Lankan smugglers in here? Yeah, man. What? Yeah, yeah, it's a national security Sri Lankan case. What? So I, I got to make sure that it's all good and stuff, but it's a really fucking cool case. We did some crazy shit on that case. Okay, so, that'd be great. Yeah, I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, But yeah, I'll do some more of my case. Then I got another one where like I investigated a criminal organization that was using Border Patrol cars to smuggle illegal aliens to the United States. And then I got another one that was a big drug trafficking case that had corrupt police officers in it and shit. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll definitely, I don't worry, know. guys. Yeah, don't, I'll tell you, I'll, I got some really cool stories. That How do you cover. know the HSI cover those? No, nah, we do, yeah. We cover, uh, we, co- we, co- we do everything the FBI does, to be honest with you. Um, the only thing that the FBI does exclusively that we're not going to do is terrorism and espionage. Okay. Like when it comes to like national security or whatever, that you get pretty much, it's going to always go to FBI for terrorism. So those are the main differences between departments? Uh, between agencies, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because like, uh, it, okay, so if I go through this real quick, you got the Department of Homeland Security and then the main agency underneath it that does law enforcement uh-huh. functions is Homeland Security Investigations. That's right. like the top agency for DHS. Then under the Department of Justice, you got the main law enforcement agency as the FBI. 
there's other agencies like ATF mm -hmm. and the U.S. Marshal Service and other stuff, but the premier agency under the Department of Justice is the FBI. And then the premier one under the Department of Homeland Security is Homeland Security Investigations, HSI. And we have a lot of overlap, like FBI investigates drugs, so do we. FBI investigates um, national security cases, so do we. Um, you know, we have a lot of different uh, overlap in cases, but the one thing that the FBI always takes lead on is terrorism right. and espionage. Wow. Those are two main things. And then they also do public corruption as well. But we could do public corruption if it interferes with, like, a crime that we investigate. So okay. let's say we get we get information that, like, a politician is involved in like smuggling, drug smuggling. Well, mm -hmm. it's going to be us because they're involved in a crime that we also do. And you have to share that with the FBI or no? Uh, it's really up to you, right, as a case agent, right? So I think to kind of not deal with problems later on, you should bring them on board because mm -hmm. like, you know, it depends on the prosecutor. The prosecutor might say, no, you should involve the FBI. It's public corruption. But would it aid the investigation to get them on or no? <sighs> You want me I mean, to give you the politically correct answer or the real answer? I mean, both, if you can, if you're at The politically it. correct answer is it should aid because you're bringing in the FBI and they have resources and they uh, get a lot of funding and, you know, technically public corruption is their is their niche. Mm -hmm. But nine out of ten times, is it going to help? No. Why? Because what ends up happening a lot of times is if the FBI is the lead agency on it, a lot of agencies are like this. If you're not the lead, they're not going to put their full effort in. So whoever's lead is typically going to care more. All right. And this is like the the, poli the political side of doing law enforcement. The lead agency is typically responsible for the case that gets the credit most of the time. Mm -hmm. So they're going to put the most effort in. But at the same time, the other agencies that are involved, sometimes they don't put as much effort in. But what's going to happen if you get them on? Like, are they going to be a burden or are they actually going to help a little bit at least? Uh, working with the FBI, usually what they do is they kind of come in, they mm -hmm. help, and then when it's time to make the arrest, they make sure they put their ray jackets on mm -hmm. and everyone thinks it's an FBI case when it wasn't. Oh, they want to take credit for it. They'll say they'll take credit for it, yeah. It's oh. something that's like very well known in the law enforcement community. Pop, pop, but, uh... Yeah, yeah, that they, that's, you know, that that's what the Bureau does. <laughs> because, because since they're the most famous agency, of course. when you do your arrests... They want all the credit. Right, right, when you do all your arrests, They're going to be there with their ray jacket and they're going to assume the public and the media is going to assume that it was an FBI case, but it really wasn't. They just were assisting. Yeah, they'll be like, the FBI, open yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that, that's what it is. So, and I'll give you guys an example here right now, right? So I'll, I'll show you real quick how to tell uh, who the lead agency is on a case. Let's use a famous one, Takashi 69 right? How are you going to, oh, in the reports? Yeah, no, I'll show you, I'll teach you, teach you right now how to do it. So USDOJ, right? 69 recording artist, right? So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen with y'all real quick and show you all this so you okay. guys learn. I'm going to teach you guys how to uh, be able to tell who the main agency is on an investigation. So uh, give me one second. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll show you guys that, how to do this. That's the Department of Justice article, like main article, right? Uh, yes, right? So here you go right here, right? So you got you know, uh, recording artists and performer Takashi 69 and five other members and associates of violent New York City gang charged in Manhattan federal court with racketeering and firearms offenses, right? So this is what you do. You come in and you look at the official thing, right? And you look. Can okay. You, can you zoom up a little bit? Because oh, can, yes. Good, good call. Good call. So you got here. Jeffrey S. Berman, United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. That's always going to happen. And then look at the, the after the U.S. US Attorney Office, look at who comes first. And Hel M. Melendez, who actually know who this guy is. Uh, he was the uh, special agent in charge for Puerto Rico. But he says, special agent in charge of the U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement, HSI, uh, of HSI and then Ashton Benedict, a special agent in charge of New York Field Office, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, that's ATF, and then James P. O'Neill, Commissioner of New York City Police Department, right? Announced the unsealing today of an indictment charging six members and associates of the Nine Trip Gangsta Bloods. The lead agency, guys, is the agency that is mentioned first. first. Okay. Okay? That's how you know when you do, when you look at the U.S. DOJ press release. That is the secret sauce to find out Which agency ran the case? Okay. And and but then that shows also. Can you go back? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, that shows also that they they are working together, like the yes. FBI and also the NYPD. Right? So FBI wasn't even involved in this case. They're and not, the they're not, ATF. They're yeah. working together. So the three main agencies, yes, they're working together. All right. So HSI was lead. ATF was working with them, and so was NYPD. But it's funny because everyone keeps saying Takashi got arrested by the FBI. No, it was HSI that got him. And I know this mm. for a fact because I was in the office when the day after they grabbed him. I was in New York City for another agent oh. case. I, I was literally there. They arrested him, I think, like November, not the day after. They arrested him sometime in mid-November. I was there in early December of 2018. Okay. okay. So. Um, you were in New or, York? No, I, no, excuse me. 
I was there in January, Jan like the first week of January, I was there in New York City. Excuse me. They grabbed him in Mar in November. I was there in January, and, so and a month later, like a month later. Excuse okay. me. Yeah, I was exaggerating. But and then so you could look here, right? Um, and then it says here, Mr. Berman, right, praised the outstanding efforts of HSI, ATF, and NYPD. So the first agency they mention is the lead agency. Mm. Okay. Um, and then here's the people that they charge and everything else like that. And then here's the indictment here, et cetera. And then the other way to tell who the lead agency is, uh, here, I'll give you all an example right now. Let's, I'm trying to think here, uh, of a case. Um, uh, damn it. I'm trying to think of a case that I can give you all an example of the, the other way to tell if, if the, so you could go with the DOJ press release and then also look at the Afian on a, on a criminal complaint. That's another way to tell. The what? The Afian? The Afian on a criminal complaint. Okay. So, for example, this guy just passed away, and I did a case on him, actually. Robert Hansen, right? He just died today, actually, June 5th, 2023. This guy got oh life God. in prison. I covered this guy's case. He was a uh, he was an FBI he agent. He just died. Yeah, he just died today. What? Yeah, he, or yesterday, technically. But he gave sole secrets to the Russians, right? And I actually did a case on this guy, a uh, really interesting espionage case. I did a, a fed on him, right? But he passed away today, right? He now had prison on life, right? Uh, so if you go Robert Hansen, what the, how affidavit. Do you, how, how do you know this? Like what? Yeah, I know. I, I just, I just, yeah. So here's a, here's an affidavit, right, guys? Obviously, we know it's FBI because we're on the website. But you look here, right? They put a table of fucking contents, man. This is not normal, by the way, guys. <laughs> so you look here. I, Stephan A. Pluta, being duly sworn to pose the state as follows. I am presently employed as a special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. Bam. Mm -hmm. So that's how you know. The, first the FBI agency. is the lead agency because mm -hmm. typically whoever writes a criminal complaint nine out of ten times is the lead agency. All right. Okay. Most of the time, not every single time, but most of the time, that's a telltale sign. So you and the at, next ones that are the ones that work together. He's I mean, not even gonna. He's gonna mention. Let me see here. He's probably gonna mention other agencies that were involved, but I think in this case it was only FBI. But wouldn't be like at the beginning. Uh, would he mention who helped him? No, no, no. The agencies wouldn't be there, like not right next to the FBI. Like after he mentioned the FBI? No, because uh, the affidavit is him simply just... So the affidavit... Here, I'll give you another example. Uh, you know what? Let's use myself as an example. Let me go ahead and Google Ooh, my real name here. Nice. All right. I'll Google my We're real fucking name. Sauce. Let's see here. We're getting the sauce Yeah. Here. Uh, hold on. Let me put... We're getting what you guys been asking for. Yeah. So, boom. Here we go, right? I'll pull up one of my own affidavits here. This is a case that I did, right? This is the Sri Lanka case I told y'all about, Can right? Down, down the Marco. Yeah, Come yeah, on. I'll give y'all some sauce. So, down the Marco. Okay. Marco. I'm a special agent of Homeland Security Investigations and have been so employed since 2013. Ooh, you your name there. I'm currently <laughs> assigned to the Human Smoking Group in the HSI Miami Field Office where I'm responsible for conducting blah, 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 blah. Right? And I talk about my experience. So in this case, right, I think I'm going to mention uh, other agencies that I worked with. Okay. The statements that contain this affidavit are based on my personal knowledge as well as information provided to me by other law enforcement officers and law enforcement personnel because this affidavit is submitted to limited to the purpose of establishing probable cause for a criminal complaint. It does not include every fact known to me in connection with this investigation. Okay? And I go into all the facts here uh, because I actually did this case with, uh, with... When was this? I did this in 2020. Okay. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, I actually signed it. Here's the day. July 16, 2020. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Whoa, it's um, recent. Yeah, that was me. Back. And I remember I actually, because it was but, during but COVID, you, you, I actually like called in on a FaceTime and swore to this affidavit. Oh my God. Yeah, I called in on FaceTime. That's and how I did my thesis yeah, for yeah. the university. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, typically an affidavit, you should put who you're also working with in the affidavit. In this case, I had I had foreign law, foreign law enforcement agencies because I did this case with Turks and Caicos Police Department and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And also had CBSA involved. So I didn't put them too, too much in here. But you typically put the other agencies that you're working with. But the main takeaway, guys, is this. Basically, um, if you want to find out, because I don't want to digress too much here. Oh if you want to find he... out who is the lead agency, go to the U.S. DOJ press release, come down, and then the first law enforcement agency that's mentioned is the lead agency. Bam. There um, you go. Right? I... So I'll give you an example. Let's go back to uh, news, right? And news, how, how do you find these affidavits? You just put your name? Uh, I, I, I did in that case, yeah, because someone like leaked it when they tried to dox me, which ended up creating this channel. So big L for y'all. Stupid. But yeah. So here's an example. 
Former co-owners of Minnesota Vikings sentenced to 75 months in prison for providing shadow banking services to cryptocurrency exchanges, right? So let's click this press release. We want to see, okay, who's lead agency in this? This just literally just happened today, June 5th, 2023, right? So you come in, all right, Damian Williams, uh, the United States Attorney for the Sun District of New York, announced today that Reginald Fowler was sentenced to 75 months in prison for arranging the process of more than 700 million, blah, 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 right? So now we're going to go ahead and scroll down because this, is this isn't an arrest. This is more of a sentencing. So you're going to come down to the bottom, right? The prosecution in this case overseen by the Office's Money Laundering and Transnational Criminal Enterprise Unit. Uh, hold on. Okay, Mr. Williams praised the outstanding effort uh, investigative work of special agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, New York Money Laundering Investigation Squad, and special agents from the IRS. So, bam, now you know the lead agency in this was FBI and IRS. Boom. There you go. Oh, okay. That's how you tell. So, it's if it's not put here in the beginning, right? Yeah. Then you're going to come down. And the U.S. attorney typically is going to congratulate agents. And then the first agency yeah. mentioned is that. So in this case, FBI. All okay. right, let's do it again. Let's go next one. Armed security guard at 26 Federal Plaza indicted for violating the constitutional rights of an individual through forced sexual assault. So I already know this is going to be FBI here because FBI typically does um, uh, constitutional rights. You let's see here. Me those classes. Uh, oh, bam. Justice. See, I already knew FBI, right? Cause FBI does a lot of the time. Like if you violate someone's like constitutional rights, right? So there you go. FBI, right? Uh, let's do another one here. Uh, twin Sinaloa cartel associates sentenced to 38 and 30, 38 and 30 years of prison for importing thousand kilograms of, co of, of narcotics. So this is going to either be DEA oh, or HSI, HSI right? Let's look. Yeah. It's going to be DEA or HSI. Let's see here. Um, or both, right? They got sentenced. Southern district of New York, or it could be both. Let's see. I'm willing to bet. Let's see here. Praise outstanding work. Bam. Got it. DEA's Los Angeles uh, Field Division, the New York Strike Force, the Hawthorne Police Department, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, Ooh. the DEA Guatemala's office, the DEA's Costa Rican co uh, country office, and DEA's Bogota country office. So this was all DEA here and one police department. Right? So and, and, that's how you know. And why not HSI? Like so, okay. This is where we get into a lot of fighting. Normally... When people are importing drugs, it's HSI all day. Okay. But what ends up happening sometimes is DEA takes importation cases and then we take distribution cases. And what I mean by that is like technically HSI shouldn't be doing drug trafficking cases in the United States that don't have an international nexus. But we do it all the time. And technically DEA shouldn't be doing drug trafficking cases that involve importation because that's HSI. So the agencies always fight though. Like where... There's times where we'll do a domestic drug trafficking investigation and HSI will be the lead. And then okay. there's times where DEA will do an importation case and they'll be the lead. Okay, and here we go. A lot of fighting. DEA and HSI guys, like, uh, let me put it this way. Okay. When I was an agent in Laredo, I was one of the few agents. We had 100 agents HSI and I think maybe like 30 agents DEA in, in Laredo. I was one of maybe five guys that worked with the DEA. Hold on, but this is my question. Out of question. 60. Out of, sorry, excuse me, out of, a, out of a, like a 60 to 100 agents, I was one of five agents that worked with DEA and got along with them. I was one of the few people that would like come to their office. But that's my question, though. Like, yeah, go ahead. Why HSI and DEA, since they like share like similarities in their cases, yeah. don't work together? I mean... Because the agent... Now, that, that sounds... You're right. Why don't they work together? The reason why is because everyone wants to be the lead agency. You don't want to work with someone else if you could get all the credit for yourself, because at the end of the day, you want to be able to finish the year and be like, we seize this much drugs. We arrested this many people so that you can get more funding. The agencies are very competitive with each other. Are literally cousins agencies, like they're cousins. It's like, yeah, it's, it's like they're, si similar. they're sizing their dicks to see who's larger or, or, or like who, who gets the ego like bigger. Yeah. It's just well, so law enforcement stupid, is a very Well, law enforcement is very A-type personality. Everyone wants to be the one that gets the credit. Um, they want to get the funding. Very competitive. And they set that up like that on purpose. So the agencies like work hard and, mm -hmm. you know, it's competitive. But, but yeah, we, there's so many times where agencies fight. I can't tell you how many times I fought with DEA agents, FBI agents. They try to take each other's cases. It happens all the time. Uh, and what, did, what is the benefit besides the credit to get like, I mean, what did they gain besides the credit? So, oh man, you really want me to do this? I'm about okay. to go into some like detail here that like no one really knows. Ooh, that's what we want. That's what we want here. <sighs> okay. I Damn. thought you guys, this is what we've been asking for. <laughs> okay. So people aren't going to like this, but I'm going to say it. So 
And you're only going to know this if you work in law enforcement. So I need y'all to like the video right here, right now, because yes. no one's going to give you guys the sauce what I'm about to I'm tell y'all. This, this is the truth that only if you work in federal law enforcement, you'll know this shit. So when you work for the government, there's something called the GS scale. You get paid on the GS scale, right? And when you're getting paid on the GS scale, the maximum is something called a GS-13. What's the GS scale? Uh, a GS scale is like how government employees are paid. Okay. Okay. So in the special agent position, the max that you can do is a GS-13. And a 13 is basically the highest you can get before you become a manager or a supervisor, which is a GS-14. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now with FBI. HSI, ATF, and a bunch of different agencies, you get that 13, something called non-competitively, okay? Basically, three to five years, you're going to have your GS-13. Why is that important? Three to five years? Three to five years. So, for example, I got hired at like a seven, a GS-7. Mm -hmm. It took me five years to get my 13. I went from seven. Oh, you got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay, before nice. I left. I went Boom. from GS-7 to GS-9 to GS-11 and, and then GS-13, right? Are you going to get a GS-10? Oh, HSI skips it. HSI goes by seven, nine, uh, 11. eleven. Then, then, uh, then. Do you hit twelves? No, eleven and then thirteen. But do you skip it? Or no, no. no I'm sorry. Eleven, twelve, then thirteen. Weird. That's how HSI does it. There is no reason. There's no reason. Yeah. Okay. Depending on if you have a master's degree, you'll get hired on as a nine. Okay. Nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's okay. Sucks. Okay. FBI, you get hired as a ten. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. DEA, though, DEA is a competitive 13. What does that mean? So HSI, DEA, ATF, most agencies, IRS as well, you get your 13 just by showing up to work every day, okay? Show up to work, um, you know, every year you're going to get your grade bump, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Because from a 12 to a 13 is typically when you hit six figures. It's a big bump. Ooh. It's the biggest bump. You'll go from making like 80K per year to making like 110K per year. Wow. Okay. So that 13 is huge when you get it. Okay. DA, however, it's a competitive 13. What does that mean? That means you have to earn that 13. Okay. Since you have to earn that 13, you have to do something called a 13 package. All right. Hang on. How do you earn it? I'll explain right now. You have to, you have to put something together called the 13 package. Mm -hmm. You have to show how many wiretaps you've done. You have to show how many informants you control how many reports you've written. Basically, I have to say, this is why I deserve a 13, because I've done all this shit. I've shown that I can Wait, uh, run a complex uh, uh, investigation. I've been the lead agent on it. I've done this many OCDF cases, which is the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force case. You have to show all these things that you've done as, as a special agent, right? Mm -hmm. Then... How do you show that in our report? You show it, like, basically you write up, like, a, yeah, a report, a, a okay. report essentially. Then you have to submit that to your special agent in charge, your SAC, and then he gives you the yay or nay on your 13. Now, with that said, if 10 guys are competing for 13s, well, guess what? They all have to be lead case agent. They all want to write wires. They all want to do this, blah, blah, blah. Wait, hang on. So, uh, so only one gets it? It depends on the office. Some offices might only give it to some guys. Some offices will give it to all guys. Every sack is different. Okay. But the point Shit. is, is that they have to articulate why they deserve a 13. So if you know that to get your 13, you have to do all this shit, you're not going to share information with other agencies. You're not going to share uh, information yeah. with other agents of that you course, even work with. It's a competition. It's com competitive, and there's a significant financial incentive to it. So the reason why DEA agents are so cutthroat, guys, is because they their 13 is competitive. Okay, how did you get yours? Who did you compete with? HSI is not competitive. You get it just by, just by being there. It's a non-competitive 13. What? FBI, DEA, HSI, non-competitive. You get it just by being, just by... Staying four or five years on the job. DEA is not competitive. Is, is, is competitive, though. One of the few agencies where it's competitive. It used to be, if we won't really want to go history here, it used to be when you were a customs agent, it was competitive. Okay. But, because HSI used to be two different agencies. It used to be INS. And ICE, right? And, uh, and INS and then Customs Service. Okay. And then they formed, they were, after 9-11, 2003, Homeland Security Act, they formed together INS and Customs to create ICE. Right. So you had INS special agents and you had Customs special agents. INS special agents, they maxed out at a 12. Mm -hmm. They could not get a 13. U.S. Customs special agents maxed out at a 13, but it was competitive. So when they merged the two together, they made it a non-competitive 13. Okay. 
So, so in your department, like if anyone's was like if anyone were like uh to get like a, a 13, they all get it. Like all the lead all, agents. No, all HSI I mean, all HSI special agents get a 13 automatically after four to five years. When they like when they basically get, like, get just, the... just 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 go for a, just work for four to five years and you'll get it. Wow. You'll get your competitive 13, you'll make a hundred thousand plus a year. But DEA is not that way, which is why DEA agents are so fucking cutthroat. I've seen DEA agents damn near want to fist fight each other in parking lots, guys. What? Over cases. Yes. Wow. Yes, I've seen it with my own eyes. But then these agencies won't take you, you guys seriously. They will see you like, oh, you guys are not like... What do you because mean? Because you didn't... I mean, the way you mentioned this, the, the way you're saying this, is like these other agencies, because you are not competing for this, right? For this J13. You're uh, you're not fighting for it like they are. There, you're not putting as much effort no, as DEA they are. No, is one of the few agencies that's competitive. No one else is competitive except for DEA. It's just one agency that's competitive. DEA, to my knowledge, I think is the only agency that's competitive. That's a competitive thirteen. Not no one FBI. Else is, no, FBI is definitely not competitive. 13, wow, no. but that's crazy though no. because then these all agencies... FBI agents are hired in a, as a GS ten. Okay. Or a, a GL ten, and then it goes after you pass ten, it goes to GS scale. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but. But yeah, right. But this then this agency must think that it's the best of them all because it's right. Like, it's literally fighting way more than these other agencies. Then I mean, DEA is one of the few. It, put it this way: DEA is a very cutthroat culture agency. They backstab it's each other for cases. Yeah. They don't share information. Uh, it's a very cutthroat agency. Of course now, it is. now with that said, the competitive thirteen is gone. You know, the, for for DEA, I say all that to say to say it's gone now. When I, right before I left the government, they, they were talking about getting rid of it. So okay. I don't think that is still required, but you have to be a GS-12, I think, for two to three years. And, and it's either you can, and you can try to get the 13 in one year, mm -hmm. or you can just wait the three years and get it non-competitively. Mm -hmm. So I think now, if I'm not mistaken, someone in the comments, if you're a DEA agent or you know for sure, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I last checked, it's a non-competitive 13 now, but you have to be at 12 for three years. And then if you don't write the package and get it, you can go ahead and get it after three years, or you can go ahead and do something called an impact 13, which is you've been a, you've been a 12 for only one year, but then you've done a lot of work and you can go ahead and write your package up and get your 13 that way. In the comments below, if you're, if you're a DEA guy, or if you work for DEA or someone knows for sure, comment below, but I'm almost certain that's what it is now, but it, forever it's been a competitive 13. So you can go yeah. your entire career and be at 12, and not make that 100 grand per year. This is very important that you mention this because it's very understandable now why, why DEA these... is the way they move. Yeah, of course. Yes. I, I mean, if I would be, be competing for my my stuff, for my records and shit, like I wouldn't be sharing and my And it's a big pump. It's it's from you're going from making a uh, $80,000 a year to like 100 something thousand yeah, per exactly. year. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be sharing anything with anybody. Yeah. I wouldn't be like working with anybody. Of course, they are the way they are. Of course. Yes. It makes sense now. Yeah. yeah. Now you guys nice. know. There you go, man. Down to Marcos Valley. Yeah. Down to Marco, and that's Marco. something that you would not know unless you were an agent and you worked with DEA very closely. I know uh, the reason why I Are know you? this guys is because I worked I worked drug cases, and I had good friends that were DEA agents, and um, I know their agency in and out. I know their how. Fuck, I even know what the reports are called. They're called DEA sixes. Oh my god! Are you even allowed to share this information? Ah, uh, no, it's, it's a lot of it is public. Okay, but but yeah, but like, uh, I, well, taking care of you, uh, man. Well, I don't know if it's public that the, the way they get paid about competitive 13s or whatever, <laughs> but that, God, that's why? not that's not like something that's like classified like that's like you could look that up and you could find it on the Internet if you were if you were to search it. But but yeah, DEA is a competitive 13 still, guys, to this day. Um, nice. And then you could do something called, like I said before, the impact, the impact 13, but it's still competitive to a degree. Yeah, you guys, you see, this is why you need to subscribe and yeah, like this Yeah, you ain't gonna get sauce video. like this nowhere else, man. I like the video too. Angie asking really good questions. Um, and this is what I mean, like, guys, I know y'all, you, know, you know, beating her up a little bit because she was being um, annoying the other, uh, the other day. <laughs> but Angie really does care. She asks really good questions and she really does care. I mean, this is very interesting. Uh, I watch a lot of movies. Like, I watch, yeah. like, I'm even researching myself here. And it's yeah. very interesting what you just it, said. And, and the thing is, I'll be honest with y'all, like, um, DEA works very hard because um, their job, you have to work weird hours, you're following drug dealers around, et cetera. So it's not an easy agency to work for. And a lot of FBI agents are lazy as fuck. A lot of HSI mm -hmm. agents are lazy as fuck. Um, DEA agents are by far the hardest working agents. By yeah. far. IRS agents, lazy as fuck, work nine to five. So I always loved working with DEA because 
They wouldn't care about going out late at night. They wouldn't care about doing surveillance. They always had task force officers that were down. Um, you know, it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, you know, um, crime to investigate, uh, drug trafficking. It's complex. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of different conspirators. You deal with informants a lot. It's a really fun, uh, way to work. But the thing is, is that like, you know, yeah, a lot of them are cutthroat. So if you find the right guys, it's awesome. The best thing that I would do is I would always work with DA agents that were already 13s. Those guys are the most chill. You uh, always want to work yeah. with DA agents that are already 13s because then it'll make it a lot easier That's for you. Crazy. Or task force officers. So um, because they're not paid by DEA, they're paid by their agency and then they're, um, and then DEA pays for their overtime. So they're actually incentivized to work overtime because their department doesn't pay for it. DEA does. So I, uh, I'm very interested in this because I actually, I don't know if you know this, I did my internships in the, in a department that was called CICBC, which is like a police department that covers, I mean, in my city, we have this thing that covers everything from narcotics, like, like any, they any, do everything. yeah, they will do everything. organized crime. Yeah, exactly. So I was like doing my internship in the forensics department Okay. because I wanted to be, I, I kind of wanted to do a, like a postgrad in like uh criminal psychology or like forensic psychology i always wanted to do this i always wanted to be a, like a forensic and yeah you'll see like these kind of cases and like you'll see like a lot of like sauce going on in that department so you have like ch a child's being like from from child's being like great by their by their families you'll see like dead people that got killed because of a cartel or something you'll see anything in there so yeah i i got to learn a lot by working with my with my supervisor, with my um, the lead uh, agent, for, that was my like helping me with my internships. Okay. So yeah, that, uh, that's why I'm so interested because in here in America it works a, a little bit different, but it's kind of like the same thing. Yeah, I mean it's competitive between yeah. law enforcement agencies for sure, but like yeah, here, um, yeah, that that's 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 kind of why DEA has the blood, um, the blood culture that they have. You know what I mean? And it's very competitive, but hey, it's good. It, it keeps all the agencies honest. And hard working, but yeah, FBI agents are pretty fucking lazy. So are HSI agents, IRS agents are lazy. DEA agents, a lot of the times, um, the, most of them are hard workers because they want to get their thirteen. Man, you get the FBI on the door. FBI, like, yeah, open up yeah, they, 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 a lot of FBI agents don't do shit, guys. I'll be honest with y'all, <laughs> because since it's such a big agency, there's only a couple of them that like really are go getters that do big cases, but most of them sit behind a desk and don't do shit. Wow. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. The agency is big enough where you can hide kind of place where you want to cross the mob anyway going back to what we're saying uh, we, <laughs> going back to regular schedule programming here guys <laughs> so you got this guy at a la salle university accounting student owes a thousand bucks to the mob because he you know decided to play some bad bets and as you guys know the mafia is notorious for running bookkeeping operations so he decides to come to the fbi uh in 1990 and uh basically be an informant La Cosa Nostra, the Italian syndicate of organized crime families, runs a profitable and bloody business there. Gambling, loan sharking, and extortion rackets. For years, South Philly was run by Angelo Bruno, known as the Gentle Don because of his dislike of violence. He took over the city in the 1950s. He was brutally murdered in 1980. The man suspected of being behind the hit was Nicodemo Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo took over Bruno's empire. He was a cold-hearted killer who ruled the city by violence. But now Nicky Scarfo is in jail. The FBI wants to find out who is running the Philadelphia mob while the boss is behind bars. Andruzzi's problem with the loan shark gives the FBI the perfect opportunity to collect new information on the organization. The college student meets with the bookmaker. He plays his part perfectly and is introduced to Salvatore Sparaccio, a known member of the Philadelphia Mafia. You don't have the money. FBI Special Agent Jim Marr was the case agent on this investigation. Salvatore Sparaccio. And as you guys know, the case agent is the guy that runs the investigation. So um, one thing I really like about this documentary is that they give you insight from the actual case agents and agents involved in the case. So you guys get a more in-depth look at the investigation.
didn't make any overt threats, but the implied threat, I'm the boss of the family, you got to pay. I want $120 a week for 10 weeks. The boss offers a repayment plan. Although the mob is charging little more interest than a credit card company, the penalty for defaulting on the loan has a far higher price. Vicky, take some cake off your watch. Thanks. For the next 10 weeks, the FBI gives Andruzzi the money to make his payments. And each time he takes the money to the bookmaker, the FBI records the conversation, building their case against Salvatore Sparaccio. Each payment is evidence of, of the crime, of racketeering. But the FBI is not interested in making low-level gambling arrests. They have a much bigger target. Sure the ultimate goal is to destroy the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family as a crime problem. Okay. Okay. Hey, Boogie, you know so much. The tactics we use are to attack the hierarchy. The the the, the structure the, the structure is the is the target, and we we attack the target through through the hierarchy. They need more information. So on Christmas Day, when they know it will be closed, the FBI breaks into the bakery shop. We proved to the judge that gambling activity and loan sharking activity was taking place in an Italian bakery. The judge authorized us to put microphones in. For the next several months, the FBI records the conversations inside the bakery. We began listening to conversations of Salvatore Sparaccio, who was claiming to be the boss of the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family. Although Spiraccio claims to be the head of the family, the FBI wire soon makes it clear that Spiraccio is not one of the big Philadelphia mafia bosses. He is little more than an employee, but the FBI doesn't know who he's working for. Thinking he can lead them to his boss, the FBI surveillance tracks Spiraccio to a law office in Camden, New Jersey. There he meets. Uh, just so you guys know, Camden is extremely dangerous, consistently in the top 10 most dangerous cities in the United States. It's right across the bridge from uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Uh, What's yeah. his name? No, Camden, New Jersey. Oh, okay. Very dangerous place to be. I would not go there if I were you guys. <laughs> Stay away from Camden with other members of the Philadelphia Mafia, including one man well known to the FBI, John Stanfa. John Stanfa is a Sicilian immigrant and a made member of the Sicilian Mafia. He worked as a driver for the late Angelo Bruno, a.k.a. the Gentle Don, former... And just so you guys understand, we break down what a made guy is, La Cosa Nostra, Omerta, we break down all the terminology and the phrases um, in the first episode that we did on the Mafia. So please go back and watch that if you haven't already so all this will make a lot more sense to you um, because the Mafia definitely uses a lot of different terms and vernaculars that you may or may not be aware of unless you're very familiar with the Italian Mafia already. ...head of the Philadelphia family. If I'm not mistaken, Stanford was, was the in first the Philadelphia made guy. Who was it? If I'm not mistaken, I think Stanfa, this guy that I mentioned right now, was the first May guy in Philadelphia. Oh, the guy so, that got killed in 80. Yeah, okay, Stanfa. he got made in the 50s and then, yeah, and yeah. Then got killed in 80. Yeah, that makes sense because he became the boss. Yeah, if you know you guys, him. like uh, May guy is a guy that belonged to, I mean, that became a member of the mafia, of, yes. uh, of a crime family. Exactly. Like a real member. Yeah. Like of the former mafia boss in 1981 and was apprehended in Maryland. Actually, um, a maid guy is somebody that uh, the, uh, signs the omerta. The yes, that goes through the ritual. That goes through and, the, yeah, that goes through the, the ritual. He's recognized. That's a maid guy. Yeah, he's recognized by the family. And we talk about the ritual as well, guys, in that first episode, what it takes to be a, you know, what yeah. the ritual is, all that stuff. So we're going to assume you guys already know all that and continue on. So go back and watch that one if you don't know what we're talking about, please. He was convicted of timestamps are in there and everything, too. So no excuse perjury in his testimony before a grand jury that was probing Bruno's death. He went to jail for eight years. When he was released, the Philadelphia Mafia put out a contract on his life for the killing of Bruno. 
Special Agent Fred Waltz is a member of the FBI's organized crime squad. Only through the intercession of his Gambino uh, associates up in New York, uh, the contract was taken off him and he was allowed to live. And just so you guys know, the organized crime squads for the FBI are the ones that are actually out there on the streets doing stuff. You know, they're terrorism squads, they're JTTFs, they're espionage squads, etc. I'll be honest with y'all, they're not really doing too much. They're not in action like that because espionage and terrorism is far and few between, my friends. So the organized crime squads is where you want to be at. The agents that do them, that are working all the time, are the bank robbery squads. And I know some of y'all are saying, like, wait, what the hell are you talking about, Myron? Yes. What? The bank robbery guys. What the fuck? are working because they get called all the time and surprisingly people still rob banks in 2023 i know it's fucking crazy i got a friend he's fbi and i to, to this day i still ask him people still rob banks and he's like yep dude people still fucking rob banks so uh yeah the guys that i would say they're probably working the most hours and uh out there the most are guys and bank robbery squads and guys that are in the organized crime squads but the rest of the fbi man a lot of them ain't doing shit. Keep it a thousand with y'all. Oh, and then child pornography too. They're probably working a good amount too because you guys would be surprised at how often you can, you know, be doing search warrants and arresting people for, for CP. It's fucking insane. After Nikki Scarfo went to jail. But HSI does most of the CP nowadays. We, we HSI definitely does way more child exploitation cases than the FBI does nowadays. Stanford returned to Philadelphia. He went to work in the construction business and laid low for a while. He was relatively quiet. So when he started to come to power, we started to notice he was making a name for himself. It came as a kind of a surprise to us. Thanks to the cooperation of the young college student, the FBI has now identified the man they believe is running organized crime in Philadelphia. We had put away the previous boss and most of the hierarchy of the family. We felt if we could put Stanford away, that we would go a long way towards the ultimate goal of, of eliminating the crime, the uh, Philadelphia family as a crime problem. On the street, informants confirm the FBI suspicion that John Stanford is the new boss of the Philadelphia mafia. Once you determine that an individual like Stanford is taking the family over, you want to see how he intends to run it. You uh, contact your informants, see what they can provide. Stanford maintains a low profile. He runs things like the gentle Don before him. He engages in traditional mob activities such as loan sharking, gambling, and extortion. The FBI wants to find out where he is conducting business. According to FBI informants, high level secret mafia meetings are being held in the lawyer's conference room. Informants uh, told us that that's where they were meeting, that they felt secure there. Uh, since it was a lawyer's office, they felt secure there from FBI eavesdropping. We decided that it would be a very... Guys, the reason why they feel secure, and I'll break it down a little bit further for y'all, is because typically conversations between a criminal and their lawyer is called, is called privileged information, which means, uh, you know, if I have a lawyer, right, and I want to tell my lawyer, hey, listen, I fucking did it. I'm a criminal. You know, I killed him, et cetera. That's considered privilege and can't be used against me, okay? Because um, the discussions between you and your attorney are supposed to be, you know, obviously sacred. It's an attorney-client privilege. So um, also spousal privilege is a thing where your wife is under no obligation to testify against you in a criminal case as well. That's also privilege. So, um, you know, I, so it's smart that the, these guys, right, would conduct all their criminal activity and their, their meetings at a lawyer's office thinking, yo, uh, you know, the FBI wouldn't think to bug a lawyer's office because if they do, then they're going to have to do something where they get a taint team to listen to all the recordings. There's going to be a lot of bullshit involved with, uh, you know, bugging a lawyer's office. It's very problematic. You're going to need the highest levels of Department of Justice approval to do it. So I can see why they did that. Very, very smart. Um, on their end. Also, you guys, you got to remember, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you guys, I mean, uh, got to remember that um, for mafia informants or, ma or mafia guys that wanted to work with a prosecutor or a, like uh, or with like, you, you mean know, a lawyer. Yeah. Or yeah, a prosecutor, okay. lawyer yeah. or just work with the with the law enforcement. Uh, they were called Pintito. And for the mafia members or for the yeah, for the mafia, it's it's like be basically it's being like a snitch. Like any informant will be like a snitch. So um you it will it's not also like frowned upon it's just like they also get like extremely rejected from any um yeah mafia like 
yeah. My, my, I mean, my, I don't know how to say this, but like, <laughs> yeah, being I a mean, snitch ain't gonna work, guys. That's basically what she's trying to tell y'all. She's gonna <laughs> leave snitches get stitches. Exactly. Very good place <laughs> uh, to put microphones. Agents prepare an affidavit to wire the premises. Oh, that's gonna be a nightmare. And and remember what I tell you guys, an affidavit is the agent, you know, preparing all the facts, writing it down, why he needs to wiretap or listen to uh individuals real time for a title three. And that's gonna be tough because you're gonna need to get an informant in there, somebody to establish that the establishment is being used to conduct criminal activity and then wiretapping a law office. Oh god, that's that's gonna be I could already see the nightmare that would be because you're going to need the highest levels of Department of Justice to like approve that. You're going to need a taint team to listen to all the recordings. Then they go ahead and give you what actually is criminal information and they go ahead and take all the privilege information out because they're not involved in the case and the case agent can't hear privilege information because they're going to fuck them up. So many different you know, nuances that could cause issues. So um, the mafia was smart for using, or in this case, the Philly mob was smart for a purpose of using a law office. I guess that's probably why they decided to do it in Camden, shitty ass Camden. I mean, recognize that intruding into a lawyer's office was extraordinary. The affidavit had to go down to the FBI headquarters. The director of the FBI personally signed off on it. Not only that, it's got to go up the Department of Justice through the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, OEO, because I know this because I've done a wiretap myself, um, Office of Electronic, um, fuck, I forget. Uh, wire operations tap, it's like uh, implanting um... yeah a wiretap is when you're listening to or a title three in this case the proper way to call it is a title three a title three is when you're listening to oral or verbal communication that's coming in or text communication coming in real time okay so what so... that means is as the target is receiving the information you're receiving it too and how how's that happen like you you plant a microphone or somebody or yeah, it could be it you plant a microphone at in their house. It could be you you listen on their phones. It could be you're intercepting their text messages. It could be you're intercepting their email. But the point of Title Three is you're receiving the information real time. As okay. the criminal's getting it, you're also getting it. Okay, I mean, and and question, like, how does that work at all? I remember once you said that the DEA is experts in like uh, planting uh, 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 Title Threes. Yeah, because they do it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does that work that out? Like, how do they do that? Because I, I've seen plenty of mafia movies and they that's how they get like all this evidence against these people is that they will be like planting microphones and like putting microphones in like their houses and stuff. How does that like how do they you really do want it? me to go through it? I mean, it's extensive. I can I can explain it if you want me to. I really want to know you. because okay. I don't really I mean, this guy's even Michael Francis said it like he he uh they will like when he got arrested i think he mentioned that they had a lot of like conversations yeah. that they had in in his house yeah with Not, his wife yeah well i don't think they wiretapped him i think they wiretapped other people that talked about him yeah probably but yeah. also um these guys these mafia people will have terminology only in case the the law enforcement will have like information against them that they will get by doing this kind of methods so yeah. I really want to know how they do it. Like how law enforcement will be like, they be like what, but like bad boys be faking. Like they are like, uh, I don't know if you see the movie, but they will be faking of being like the play guys to check on their house and they'll be <laughs> planning like microphones and shit. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and explain this, but I need you guys to like the video. All right. Because this is, uh, I, um, I mean, you don't have to explain it if you don't, if you don't want to, but no, I can, I can. It's just that it's, it's a little, I'll try to do it quickly. So, um, so this is how it works. For you to get a Title III, you need a lot of information, right? So if you want to wiretap someone's phone, for example, right? I'll give you an example. You want to wiretap a criminal's phone. Let's say I know that Tom is the head of a drug trafficking organization, right? But I know he is, but I don't necessarily have evidence yet. Well, I know a guy that works for him. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a, a regular guy that sells drugs, right? So what I do is I arrest that guy for selling drugs his his lackey let's say his name is john mm -hmm. right and i'm like listen john i know you work for tom selling drugs i know he supplies you you got two choices either a you're going to work for me and you're going to help me get tom or you're going to go to prison and you're going to take it out okay that's how right? they didn't break him back okay so he okay. says okay i will cooperate with you cool this is what you're going to do you're going to call tom right now and say you need a kilo of cocaine and you're going to go pick it up sometime. All right. 
I'm simplifying this for you, by the way, guys. You would never say you want a kilo of cocaine. You would say maybe an ounce or whatever because you don't want them to be scared, but I'm making it simple. He's like, okay. So he calls him. Hey, I need, I got a buyer. I need a kilo. Can I get it from you? Tom says, yeah, I got a kilo coming in a week. Come next Wednesday. Cool. I send John in. I have John wearing a wire. I have him on, I'm on surveillance with my, my other people. He goes in. He picks up the kilo of cocaine from him. And uh, he comes out. Cool. Now, I have John's number. I have this informant that's been talking to him. Now I'd say, okay, John, I want you to make a phone call as well and order more. He calls again and says, yo, I need more. John says, yes, I can go ahead and get you more drugs. No problem. I got it. Cool. Now, I say, I need to listen to John's phone. Okay? Or, t excuse me, Tom's phone. Oh, wait. Uh, isn't this guy, John, getting, like, more charges to his, like, sentence? No, because, because I'm directing him to com commit criminal activity. Okay. I'm directing him, so he's wor working uh, working as an informant. You could commit crime as an informant if I'm directing you to do it. Okay. And he's right? not getting charged for it. He's not going to get charged for okay. it. He's basically working off the charge that I got him for. Okay. Right? So now, I now I go to the prosecutor and say, hey, listen, prosecutor, I need to listen to Tom's phone so that I can see who he's getting the drugs from. Mm -hmm. Because obviously Tom has a connect who's getting him large quantities of drugs. Awesome. So now I write up an affidavit. It's going to be long. And I'm going to write how uh, John, my informant, talks to Tom on the phone. And this phone that John talks to Tom on is used to commit criminal activity. And I need to establish that my informant is committing criminal activity with this bad guy. And this is the phone number that he's using. I need to listen to this phone so that I can identify other conspirators. Okay. Right? So I write up this affidavit. It's typically very long. I need to write why I need to, you know. And here's the other thing, too, with the affidavit. You have to establish that you exhausted all other investigative steps. Okay? That's something right there. What do you mean right? by that? Oh, shit! Oh, shit! So oh, shit. I need to say, I've done surveillance. I've done trash pulls. I've tried getting an undercover agent in. I've tried X, Y, Z. I cannot do anything else to exploit this this uh, organization unless I do this Title Three, which is fairly easy to establish mm. because, to be honest, you know, watching a guy all the time, you're going to get burned. And do trash pulls aren't helpful like that, which is basically when you go pull the guy's trash. Okay. Um, you know, you can only get maybe one informant in. Getting an undercover agent is very difficult and do, dangerous sometimes. Do you need permission by somebody or like a court or something? Well, or I'm going to say that. So you write the affidavit up, right? And you give it to the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Prosecutor, you and the prosecutor go back and forth, make sure it's you know legally sufficient. You've established everything that you need. You've exhausted all the other investigative options. And then uh, it goes to the top prosecutor. Then it goes to the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And then they review it. And then they say, okay, it's good to go. And then you turn it on and you can finally start listening to the guy's phone. And then as you listen to the guy's phone, guess what? You listen to him talking to Timothy, uh, fucking Tom. Jamal, okay. another guy <laughs> from all different parts of the country getting this cocaine. Now what you could do is you could write wiretaps for all their phones too. And you get a Rico. And then you go ahead and you do a big conspiracy case. But that's how it starts. I gave you guys a very simplified version. There's more with like toll analysis and everything else like that. But in general, that's how you get a wiretap going in a drug investigation. I did it off a of drug investigation because that's the easiest way to articulate it. Hey, that's how we got the Black Panther family. The <laughs> Uncle Monko. So y'all ain't gonna get sauce. Who else is gonna teach you guys how to do a fucking wiretap or how a wiretap works anywhere else on YouTube? Nobody else. Like the goddamn video. It's, you got some, Angie? Yeah, I mean, that's how they got the Black Panther family. Remember that they got a yeah. bunch of informants to get yeah. it and they like connected the dots? Yep. And also, yeah, it's pretty much like the movies then. Yeah, it is, but, but it takes a lot of probable cause to, to get up and on a wiretap. It's not easy. That's the one thing that the movies think is easy. No, it's extremely difficult but to get a wiretap. But you need like an order from somebody. Then. Yeah, so so it goes, here's the thing. It goes from you to the AUSA. Once the AUSA says it's good, he's got to send it to the uh, USA in charge mm -hmm. of his area, who's presidentially appointed, by the way. Mm -hmm. Then from wow. him, okay. it's got to go to a district. It's got to go to OEO, which is Department of Justice, for mm -hmm. another review. Once that's approved, then it goes to a district judge. Then you go to the district judge and you sign it. And the district judge might still say, I need some other more shit. Okay, like, but it has like four four what? levels of people it goes through. Like filters. Yeah, but like, how long does that take to get approved then? It, it That's gets, so annoying. Yeah, it's a long ass time. I remember when I did my affidavit, I was going back and forth like uh, for a month. But long ass time, how long? It took me like a month. 
a month? Like, I, I it took me like a month to write the affidavit, and then go back and forth. Everything, yeah. And and the bad guy was switching his phone number in between. I had to keep I had to keep updating the new phone number and the phone tolls. But then, I mean, in this month or whatever time, this guy John can be killed for even like suspicious. Yeah, like getting the suspicion of working with you guys. Yeah, I mean that that's why you you know you got to do everything in your power to make sure the pre informant is protected and you're not making it too hot. You're only making dirty calls when you need to, so it's not too easy. Yeah, there's a lot of shit that goes into. It. I simplified it for you, but yeah. Man. Yeah, it's not easy. But yeah, wiretaps, everyone thinks it's easy to get a wiretap. It's extremely difficult, guys. Extremely difficult. And I'm talking to you guys as Pretty someone sure who actually wrote a wiretap. Most, I'll put it this way, 90% of federal agents have never done a wiretap in their life. 90% easily. Sure? 90% easily of special agents have never done a wiretap in their life. I can concretely say that. Do you ever do that? Yes, I did one. You That's did how one? I know. Okay. And I was affian on it. That's that's how I know. But 99% of it, like, you know what? Maybe even more. Because the only agency that really does wiretaps, there's only like three or four agencies that even do wiretaps. HSI, DEA, DEA and FBI. DEA agents, a good percentage of them do, do wiretaps because they want to get the 13. But most HSI agents have never never done a wiretap. I remember when I was... uh. When your case, why did you do it? Like, why did I do it? Yeah. Because I was a go-getter. I was a hard worker. Everyone used to get mad at me, though, because they're like, bro, you're making us work. What the fuck? Because wiretaps need a lot of surveillance and shit. A go-getter. I never heard that before. But like, uh, what's, yeah. what's the, what was your case? Like, what do you, It was a drug case. Okay. It was a drug case that I did it on. But there was also some like violence involved and shit like that, too. Okay. So, um, but uh, but yeah, um, it was a drug slash organized crime case. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not asking stupid questions. No, no, no. Here. These are good questions. A lot of people <laughs> ask this. But like, but yeah, like, um, and I'm sure the audience probably has these questions, too. But yeah, it, it's um, yeah, easily 90% plus of special agents have never done a wiretap. Uh, and here's the other thing. Some other agencies can't do it. Can't? They can't because um, only under. Okay, now we're. Yo, this is probably going to be one of the most informative episodes of Fed Reacts you guys have ever seen. Hey, don't do a micro for that. Yeah, don't do a micro for that one, man. Because y'all are getting some sauce right now. Federal judge the gives the. Oh, oh, my bad. <laughs> uh, so hold on one second. Let me go ahead and. What you gonna look for? Okay, eighteen USC. I kind of wonder if uh, if like planting like wiretaps, wiretap something, a house or like somebody like a a mafia boss, like you know the bad boys movie is kind of like that. Like you have to go like undercover and do it, or like how does that work? If they actually do it, I don't know if that. Here if, we go. If it happens in the real life, my... so here we go right here. It's um. The definition statute found in 18 U.S.C. Section 2501 defines the terms wire communication, oral communications, state intercept, electronic, mechanical, or other device person, uh, investigate, or law enforcement officer, content, contents judge of competent jurisdiction, communication, etc. So, what's that? So basically, uh, only certain 1811s or only certain special agents can even apply for a wiretap. Uh, let me see here if it has. Oh, and that's by Cornell Law School. Yeah, nice. so like some of them can't even do it. I know DEA, HSI, FBI, those three agencies can do it. I think ATF can do it too. Um, Title T prohibits unauthorized interception. Uh, I'll find it for y'all, <laughs> but not every single 1811 or special agent can actually do it. Only certain agencies can do wiretaps. Oh, do you think we can find that in the internet? Yeah. Um. Let's see here. It was added to the miscellaneous provision of the Violent Crime Control Act. Uh. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into wiretaps, guys. It's it's not as easy as TV tries to make it. Like wiretapping someone's phone, it's actually very difficult. <laughs> and the reason why it's so difficult is because it's the highest level of invasion on someone's privacy when you're listening to their phone calls. And you got to keep in mind when you're listening to their phone calls, you're listening to everyone that's calling them. So some people might not even be criminals. So that's why it's so uh, it's so uh, invasive. We should do a video just in 
call it like wiretaps no uh like answering angie's annoying questions about law enforcement in america yeah it's all good all right <laughs> we'll keep going so so he's talking about a federal judge it's got to be a district judge by the way guys it's a federal district judge not a regular magistrate fbi the green light Agents install a hidden video camera outside the law office so they can monitor anyone who enters or leaves the building. All right, that's just a poll camera. You don't need you don't need anything for that because that is considered a public inf- a yeah. public area. So you can put a poll camera and watch them, you, no problem. You didn't listen to my questions. I was just asking this, but like from inside, how do you get a camera or a, a microphone inside a house? They do it. So what they do is they wait when no one's there and they'll do it surreptitiously. They'll secretly sneak in there and. and uh, put it in, or they'll pose as like a, a cable company or something like that. Oh, do okay. It. They've done like that before too. Okay. How about now? But they have to have the court order to do so first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like my voice. A special FBI entry unit will install a hidden microphone inside the law offices. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it depends on the situation. Normally, it's better to do it under a disguise. But other times, you don't have that opportunity because they might not have work coming in or whatever it is. Like they might not need electric electricity done or redone or, or plumber or any of that like so they just go in at night late when no one's there and they yeah. break in agents this is also done a lot in national security cases where someone is like a spy or something they'll go in there and they'll break in and put cameras in and hey we saw like an anna montes video yeah. yes yes and th- that's different that now when you go through a fisa court that's completely different you don't need as much probable cause you could violate all kinds of rights when it comes to espionage and national security when it's just a criminal case, you need a lot of probable cause. When it's when it's national security, that Patriot Act, they don't give a fuck. Make a surreptitious entry into the second floor suite. In terms of, uh, of the actual entry into the premises, it's what I regard to be one of the most dangerous things the FBI does because you're 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 burglarizing someone else's property. Although you have authority to be there, the person if you if you encounter someone, he doesn't know that you have authority to be there. Inside, the agents fear they've been discovered. An armed deputy sheriff is inside the building. The night before we went in, the uh, re-elect the sheriff campaign moved into the ground floor. The agents making the entry were surprised by a deputy sheriff. Fortunately, uh, they were able to conceal themselves. He got in and got out before there was any problem. Technicians install a microphone in the conference room. The surveillance agents will first try to identify each suspect and determine their roles in the organization. There's 18 FBI agents who do nothing but physical and photographic and video surveillances. Most of their work they did for the organized crime squad. So we've got a lot of manpower out there and we've got people who who know how La Cosa Nostra works. And we can a lot of times figure out a hierarchy just by watching the way that they behave towards one another. That coupled with information coming from informants can tell us who the hierarchy is. Agents monitoring the conversations have to match the voice on the wire to the face in the video surveillance. John Stanford was very easy. He had a very heavy Italian accent. Uh, so it was very easy to figure out uh, when he was speaking. But the agents have a problem. The conversations we intercepted in the office indicated to us that they were uh, leaving the conference room and going somewhere. After going to all the trouble to plant the wire, the mob boss moves the meetings. The surveillance agents will have to find out where the meetings are now taking place. They will have to place another bug. A few days later, the FBI learns from an informant that a high-level sit-down is about to take place at the law office between John Stanfa and several associates. They need to get the new bug in place before the meeting. But they don't know where the meeting will be held. Agents dispatch an undercover detective to follow Stanfa into the office. Philadelphia detective Mark Panero gets the job. 
we try to come up with a reason to actually go into the law firm to get a, a closer look at what was going on. So we had come up with a cover story uh, utilizing a, a name of an attorney that we knew had left that firm. But it does not go exactly as planned. This uh, unknown individual held the door for me to go in first, which kind of uh, set me back because I want to go in second. I want to see where they they were going before I was attended to. But I was relieved when I walked in and the receptionist greeted John Stanford and John Stanford told her, let him know I'm here. And uh, the receptionist immediately keyed her uh, intercom and let the lead attorney of this law firm know that John was there and to send him in. So not only was I able to get her to identify John Stanford, I was able to stand there and watch him go down to the actual office of this lead attorney at uh, this law firm. That's good. That's real good. Okay, lock it on. Thanks. With this information, a federal court approves an affidavit for a second break-in at the office. Agents install hidden microphones in the attorney's office. Shortly after the new bugs are placed, agents hear some alarming news on the wire. The mob bosses are afraid they are being watched. They hire a private counter-surveillance contractor to sweep the law offices for bugs. If he finds oh boy, oh shit, oh shit, oh. a listening device, the entire operation could be destroyed. The FBI in Philadelphia is closing in on mob boss John Stanfa. They learn he is conducting mob business in an attorney's office. Agents place listening devices in the office. But Stanford calls in a man to sweep for bugs. Agents watch as the sweeper enters the building. Their entire case could collapse if he finds their bugs. Here they come. But after a few tense minutes, the private contractor completes his sweep without finding anything. It sort of brought a smile on everybody's face because uh, they basically brought in an expert who didn't detect anything. So that would bring a sort of a feeling of ease on their part. And uh, I guess our expectations were that they would be even more at ease to discuss further criminal activity. Now with microphones in the conference room and the lawyer's private right. office, the information begins to come in. The FBI learns that John Stanford is having problems with a group of young mobsters. Born and raised in South Philly, their allegiance is still with Nicky Scarfo and the mafia regime before Stanford took over. They are known as the Young Turks. As far as they're concerned, Philadelphia is and always has been their turf. And the Young Turks deserve to be running the crime family, not newcomer John Stanfa. I always do the best job. Joey Merlino is the boss of the Young Turks. Michael Changlini is the number two man. Joey and Michael have known each other since grade school. FBI Special Agent Gary Langdon is the co-case agent. They didn't like the fact that John Stanford, who they considered an outsider, would come in and take over the mob family. And so they... And the co-case agent, guys, is the guy that also runs the investigation with the main case agent. And typically, you know, when you have a case big like this, you're going to need two, three co-case co agents a lot of the times. So, um, and when you got like a case like this, it's going to be mafia, whatever, you're going to need as many people as you can. So a, a case like this is being worked with the, by the entire squad, all... 10, 15 agents are all working one big case together, and the case agents are the ones that are dictating the case because you can't write all the affidavits yourself. You can't be dealing with all the informants yourself. You need someone else that also has a strong interest in the investigation being done correctly uh, alongside you, and the co-case agent is supposed to do that. Um, so, yeah, big cases, 
at least two to three case agents easily, sometimes even more. I remember when I remember when I had my big uh, OSEDEF case, I had a case agent from DEA, I had a case agent from ATF, I had a case agent. My, obviously, I had two case agents uh, myself from HSI. I had a Border Patrol guy assigned to me, so it was a big deal. And when you have big cases like this, it's a lot of manpower, guys. We're trying to organize them all in a little group, even though they were part of the overall picture and they wanted to be in charge. Informants tell the FBI that the Young Turks are not taking orders from John Stanfa. He doesn't want the city. They bragged about the, who they were and who they were aligned with. Bragged about how they were going to take the city over. They were the legitimate successors to the previous mob members under Nikki Scarfa. They were going out and shaking down uh, bookmakers, drug dealers, uh, and even in shaking down legitimate businesses and uh, weren't sharing the profits, to, you know, kicking upstairs to stand for. The young Turks feel they're entitled to run the city and the Philadelphia mafia. The aging John Stanfa, the old world Sicilian boss, resents the ostentatious lifestyle of the Young Turks. The Young Turks, if you will, were very, very uh, flamboyant. They'd go into the clubs on Delaware Avenue, throw their weight around, push people around, uh, trade on the fact that they were connected to the local Cosa Nostra family, and in general, call attention to themselves. Uh, which is not a good thing. If you're running a Cosa Nostra family, you should be low key. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, girls, get in the car. Jake, come on, get out of here. Start it up. The Young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, has a different idea of how a Cosa Nostra boss should live the life. He was the kind of guy who felt that when he went into a restaurant because- And remember guys, so you know, this contradicts the Amerta or the code of silence, all right? And we go about this in more detail in the first episode, of the Italian mafia, but these new school guys don't get it. They don't understand the rules that you're supposed to. Um, they don't understand the code. Yeah, they don't understand the code, and this is bad. You don't want to bring attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the last thing the mafia wants um, when it comes Especially to the Especially this Philadelphia activity. family. Yeah. Because he has a lot of influence of Angelo Bruno, which was uh, the guy, the, the mafia boss that kind of like beyond like uh, among all the mafia bosses he was the, like the Quietus. one that wanted like the peace like he wouldn't like the violin uh of like the mafia you know he would be like trying to ne negotiate the, the peace in between like you know and he's smart because violence what does it do it brings attention brings attention that's why he didn't like the yeah. violence yeah so you know he ended up getting killed himself but you know when he was in rule uh you know he was keeping things nice and quiet which is mm -hmm. why if you think about it the Philadelphia Mafia lasted a lot longer than the New York guys. <laughs> yeah, and it was very powerful too. Yeah, so. Who we were. Which, I mean, hell, you could tell they were powerful because you guys have been asking us to do these guys for a while. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He shouldn't have to pay. Uh, this was easily adopted by his entourage and they became a problem for everybody. There, there, was, there were fights, there were shootings, there were, uh, it's just not the way to run a Cosa Nostra family. Uh, attracting all that attention to yourselves. Uh, the police begin to know then where you are and uh, who you are, and it's just not a good thing. John Stanford was particularly angered by the Young Turks' involvement in the sale of illegal narcotics. That was the way of the future, the easy way to make money. Um, traditionally, the mob uh, frowns upon uh, having its members engage in drug dealing. Now, that that's not to say that they, they don't do it. They get around that by uh, having an associate or something uh, deal drugs, and then they'll tax that individual and take a percentage of it. But Stanford, you know, he thought drugs were a dirty business, and it draws a lot of attention, again, to the family. And uh, he didn't want to do that. And these guys were just uh, the fine. And this was confirmed also, guys, by uh, Michael Francis when he brought him in. Mm -hmm. The old school guys almost always stayed away from drugs. And if they did, uh, be, if they were involved in drug trafficking and they got caught, it was something that was punished by death. Uh, because the mafia looked at it as a very dirty business. A lot of snitches, a lot of rats brought attention to you. And, guys, back then, drug trafficking got really high sentences. So it's one thing to get arrested for 
maybe some tax evasion, maybe some fraud, maybe some illegal gambling. You don't do that much time for that. You take a pinch, as they would call it, right? You know, it is what it is, right? Forget about it. But you go down for 10 kilos of coke, you're going to do some time. And not only that, every agency investigates drugs. FBI, open up! So that's what they did not want, my friends. So um, did some guys be involved in some drugs? Yes, John Gotti, etc. famously was involved in drug trafficking. But... They did everything in their power so other people wouldn't know about it, right? And they caught that, and they knew that he was supposed to be drug trafficking because when they listened to him on wiretaps, he would talk about, hey, we can't be talking about drugs like this, blah, 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 because if the family finds out, it is what it is. So it's something that the guys did on the side to earn. But um, if you got found out or caught for it, you definitely were going to get to get whacked. But these new school guys, they want to get involved in drugs when the old school guys stayed away from that. I am doing not to be confused with the Sicilian mafia, who they were definitely involved in drugs. The old, the, you know, the original town yeah. guys, old town guys, yes. They were involved in drug trafficking, which you guys go ahead and watch our podcast on the Bonanno crime family, where we talk about that in more detail. But the American Italian mafia did not participate in drugs overtly. And if they did, it caused serious consequences, man. Mm -hmm. They were more concerned with other ways to earn. It was very frowned upon. It was very frowned upon, guys. So go ahead and watch that podcast on the Bonanno family. We talk about Bonanno and obviously the, um, uh, God damn it, um, Joe Pistone, right? The uh, FBI agent, uh, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco. We talk about that in detail as well because um, the Bananas were involved in some drug trafficking because they had a tight connection with the guys out of the old Sicilian family. But uh, but yeah, the American Italian Mafia did everything in their power a lot of the times to stay away from drugs. Some guys were involved, but it was not supposed to be done, guys. Once we heard that there was friction developing, we were looking to see how Stanford was going to handle it. Okay, was he going to be aggressive? and uh you know take extreme measures or was he going to try and uh, mollify these people and uh, quiet them down and get them under his uh uh wing so to speak but joey merlino isn't going under anyone's wing the young turks strike back at stanford 73 year old joseph gatone is one of mafia boss john stanford's most loyal employees Gatone is a bookmaker, a collector of street taxes. Four gunshots shatter the daily routine of Joseph Gatone. The old man's blood marks the beginning of a deadly civil war. The FBI and the Philadelphia Organized Crime Task Force surveilled top bosses of the Philadelphia Mafia. Friction between feuding factions of the crime family increase and a bloody civil war breaks out. Philadelphia police officers arrive at the scene of the shooting. The victim's keys are still in the ignition and the engine is still running. Two bullets penetrated the victim's neck. A third bullet entered his temple. A fourth grazed the bridge of his nose and shattered the passenger side window. When Agent Marr arrives on the scene, Police have already checked the registration of the car, but they don't yet know who the victim is. Agent Marr recognizes the victim from previous investigations. Gatone is a longtime member of the Philadelphia crime family, currently under the leadership of John Stanfa. Several of Gatone's neighbors witnessed the shooting, but no one can identify the lone hooded gunman. Special Agent Jim Marr suspects Joey Merlino's young Turks are behind the killing. Where he was killed, the manner in which he was killed, indicated to me that the Merlino faction was sending a message to Stanford and his people. We're here and we are to be reckoned with. John does. Agents monitor their wiretaps. But no one is talking about the murder. Special Agent Fred Walls. Initially, at the time that uh, this bookmaker was murdered, uh, we weren't sure who was involved. There was nothing definitive on the uh, wire after the bookmaker had been murdered. There was a reference to the fact, but nothing that would indicate to us that Stanford had a belief someone had done it or someone hadn't done it. Investigators are certain the murder is mob-related, but they have no proof. When they speak to Stanford himself, he claims to know nothing. But Stanford strikes back, 
Five weeks after the murder of John Stanford's bookie and tax collector, Michael Changlini, the Young Turks' number two man, is coming home after a basketball game. Two men armed with shotguns open fire. That's some old school shit right there. Not giving a fuck. Yeah, we're just going to go ahead and shoot broad daylight. We don't care. And I'll tell you all this. When you're in the middle of a gang war and you're intercepting stuff on the phone, that's a nightmare for you because if you get information that someone's going to be killed, you have to, like, let them know. Matter of fact, John Gotti would be dead if it were not for the FBI, guys. Uh, the FBI actually notified John Gotti when they were going to try to whack him uh, after he took uh, power because he actually killed the boss prior which was a big no-no um, for uh, for the mafia where you would go ahead and kill a boss without certain approval. And it was, um, uh, God damn it, uh, the Chin, the mob boss, the Chin, who actually wanted John Gotti gone, but the FBI notified John Gotti and he was able to evade uh, a certain meeting where they were going to kill him at, which we broke down in another episode. So go back and watch that episode on the crazy Don, the Chin. Somehow, Changlini, his wife and two children, were uninjured in the attack. Investigators recovered 12-gauge shotgun shells from the front yard and shotgun pellets from the ceiling of the living room and dining room. Despite the brazen attack on Changlini and his family... He was just like, he just started running, that's why he got... I mean, wow, he just saw the guys coming and he ran inside. Yeah. I mean, yeah, How it's a reenactment. Escape? I don't know if it went exactly like that, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he escaped. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He's lucky he didn't get killed. He won't cooperate with the detectives. Now, Omerta, of course, he's not going to say nothing. Uh, he wasn't going to say anything. They just don't talk to law enforcement. They, they feel they're going to handle it themselves. It's business, okay? It's, and it's none of our business. So you're not going to get anything out of them. The Young Turks' number two boss isn't talking. But the FBI suspects the attack is payback for the murder of John Stanford's bookie. After the bookmaker's uh, murder and then the attempt on Michael Cinglini, we believed that we were going to see uh, an increase in violence. There was going to be a potential mob war. Fearing this, the FBI petitions a federal court to expand the eavesdropping. In the spring of 1992, they get translation. They write more affidavits to rationalize having more bugs on the premises. The court order they need. Agents place bugs in seven new locations, including lawyers' private offices, the law library, the what? television room, and the that? lunchroom. Yeah, that's crazy that they were able to do that. That means if they, since they were able to go ahead and put it in a lawyer's office, guys, that tells me that they had a taint team ready. And what a taint team is, guys, is a team that purposely is going to listen to information that more than likely is not going to be usable for a criminal case. And they're going to filter out the stuff that is pertinent to the case and the stuff that isn't pertinent, they're not going to use. And these are agents that are not involved in the investigation at all because the case agent can't hear information like that because it's going to taint him. This is all the case, also the case when you deal with classified information. You got something? No, I'm just shocked that they actually like went into the office and planned it like yeah. microphones. Yeah, because what? They, what, basically what they're arguing is that they're having meetings at different parts of the office, so the only way that we're going to hear all the conversations is if we put bugs everywhere. And for this to happen, I already know this. They're not saying this in this documentary because they don't want to put you all to sleep, but I already know that they have a taint team in place. This is very common. What is a taint? A taint team is a group of agents oh, that, they, they listen. Like, that listen you, in what you said. and okay. anything that's privileged or classified or something that isn't supposed to, the case agent isn't supposed to hear. They're going to listen to it, yeah. and then they're going to give the case agent the stuff that is a part of the case, yeah. and, and then they're going to go ahead and deal with everything else that's considered tainted. Okay. These are civilians, right? Like they don't. No, no, no. They're other agents. Oh. Okay. They're other okay. agents, but they're agents that are not, they're not Into case the agents. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, when they raided Trump's house, they knew a bunch of the information was going to be commingled with lawyer information. So a taint team went in, looked at it first, and then they gave the actual search team the information that was pertinent to the case. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a lot of work, though. Yeah, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of fucking work. Their entire field office was probably involved in this. The new wires immediately start paying off. How we doing, huh? 
Early in May of 1992, FBI cameras catch Stanford arriving at the law office with his consigliere and Joseph Changlini, brother of the young Turk's second in command. Inside, John Stanford angrily announces that he knows the young Turks are looking for him. They want him dead. But Stanford doesn't want a war. He wants to make one last attempt at diplomacy. His first move is to make Joseph Changlini his new underboss. I guess he thought as a concession to them, he would be able to control them. There's a saying, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer. This was the way to keep uh, an eye on them. They, but we fully anticipated that we were gonna see an increase in violence, but uh, we were surprised by what did happen. Informants tell the FBI that Stanford invites Joseph Changlini's younger brother, Michael, and the young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, to a secret meeting. Here, Joey and Michael become made members of La Cosa Nostra. You have to swear to uh, place the family before anything else in your life. God, your, per you know, your, your own personal family, your mother, your father, your wife, your children. If the family calls you, you come before them. Now, as made members of La Cosa Nostra, the two young Turks enjoy special privileges. The, the benefits that come with that are that uh, you can conduct your rackets, whatever they may be, without fear of interference from someone who is not a member. The family in a dispute will always decide in your favor if you are a member and the other person is not. A member cannot be killed unless the boss of that family, to which he's a member, approves. For John Stanford, promoting the Young Turks is his final act of diplomacy. The FBI and the Organized Crime Task Force will keep a vigilant watch to see if Stanford's bold move stops the violence. But agents still need to collect more information about the crime family to shut them down for good. Through an informant, they learn the law office is not the only place where Stanford and his associates are congregating. We found out that uh, Stantha had opened up a dinette next to another business he owned, which was a food uh, distribution business. And surprisingly, uh, Stantha actually worked at this place every day. You know, it's a John Q. citizen. He would go to work and he actually worked there. You'd see him out there sweeping and uh, cooking and handling stuff. But he was also meeting his uh, family members there and discussing mob business. So the next step logically is to attempt to get a Title III bug installed in the dinette so that we can listen to them. There you go. See, Title III. Like, agents always call it Title III. We don't call it fucking tapping phones. or just say a T3. Conversations he's having with uh, these uh, members and uh, associates of the family. Once the microphone is installed inside the dinette... <laughs> The FBI hears that an angry John Stanfa is still having problems with the young Turks. He requests a final sit down with Joey Merlino. Joey Merlino and Michael Changlini pay a visit to Stanfa. Gamblers are complaining that the young Turks are not honoring their bets. Merlino assures the boss he'll fix the problem and make good on the debts. Pay the bill. The meeting ends amicably. Perhaps there can be peace within the family. Early in March. FBI surveillance agents observe Joseph Changlini and a waitress opening up the Stanford dinette. It's almost exactly one year after his brother Michael was nearly gunned down at his home. His activities were easy to document. 
Uh, he was regular. He, uh, he got up in the morning and he went to work. But on this morning, Joseph Changlini's routine takes a terrifying twist. Four men pull up and open fire on Changlini and the waitress, reigniting the bloody war between the old and the new mafia of South Philadelphia. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! On March 2nd, 1993, in South Philly, underboss Joseph Changlini and a waitress opened John Stanford's diner. Shortly after 6.30 a.m., four gunmen launch an attack. Changlini is gunned down. The surveillance agent alerts FBI HQ and calls 911 for an ambulance. The FBI agent on surveillance arrives on the scene. Joseph Changlini has been shot repeatedly in the head, neck, and chest. The waitress is unharmed. Changlini has somehow managed to survive the deadly attack. Though severely wounded, he can talk. You couldn't get a statement out of him, and even if he knew who did it, he, he wasn't going to implicate anybody. He was, he was part of the mob, the Omerta, the Code of Silence, and, and uh, they would take care of this on their own. They had to know who they were. He saw them. Uh, we suspected that it was a group from the Young Turks, and, but he basically told us he didn't know anything. Hoping to identify the shooters, FBI agents review the surveillance tapes. Now, remember, guys, this is the 1990s, okay? You ain't going to be able to get, like, the best type of quality off of fucking VCR, VHS, okay? Um, it's not like nowadays where you can, like, zoom in and get this best, you know, type technology. Mm. This is the early 90s, man, so they're limited at best here. <laughs> but in the early morning darkness, the images are too dark to identify anyone. The uh, video was very grainy, very blurry. It was very hard to uh, identify with any kind of particularity uh, features where you would recognize who actually went in, but you couldn't see four shapes going in. Then you, you go to the uh, audio and you hear uh, screaming and you hear shots. And then you hear uh, someone yelling, move, move. And then they exit the place and they drive away. Well, that's basically all we had. You couldn't say with any reasonable certainty who actually went in there and shot okay, Joseph okay. Chinglini. But agents are still surveilling the law office. In the listening post, wiretaps record a chilling conversation between Stanfa and a mob associate. John Stanfa suspects Michael Changlini was behind the attempt to kill his own brother, Joseph, at the restaurant. Yeah, Michael and Joey were on the uh, opposite sides of internal war within the Stanford family. They were half-brothers, and it didn't make any difference. He wanted to, he thought his brother Joey was on the wrong side, and he's going to take him out. For John Stanford, there is only one choice. Eliminate Joey Merlino and the Young Turks. So he starts to recruit uh, his own muscle to send them out and to start stalking these young Turks and trying to uh, kill Joey Merlino, Michael Cinglini, and the people associated with him. Undercover FBI agents deliver a warning to Merlino and Michael Cinglini. What's going on, fellas? When we're aware of the fact that uh, uh, violence is going to occur or may occur, and we think we know who the violence is going to uh, occur against, we have an obligation to go out and warn them. John Stanford is sending hit teams into the streets with orders to gun down Merlino and Changlini. The Young Turks shrug off the FBI warning. Even though they know their lives are in danger, they refuse to cooperate. The Young Turks should have listened to the FBI. A Stanford hit team tracks them down and opens fire in broad daylight. Michael Changlini is shot in the heart and dies on the street. Joey Merlino is wounded. 
it is clear to the FBI that John Stanfield means business. He's uh, taken up the uh, challenge and he's retaliated with a lot of force. So that's where we are right then and there. We believe that Stanford is responsible for it. Now we have to prove it. Three hours after the shooting, South Philadelphia police officers respond to a burning vehicle. The car matches the description of one seen by witnesses at the shooting. Police run a trace and common tactic after a vehicle is used in a uh, obviously a violent, a violent or serious crime burned down uh you know to destroy evidence learned that it was leased to a member of the stanford crime family that night police questioned phil coletti and his wife she tells police she reported the car stolen coletti says he has been home all day yeah nice alibi the FBI views the couple's alibi with skepticism. Coletti becomes the first suspect in the shooting murder of Michael Changlini. Several days later, the FBI gets a lead on the second shooter. The FBI received a call from a, a, a physician who said that he had treated an individual who came in with burns. That he felt were rather suspicious. FBI agents find John Vesey at home. He, too, is a known member of the Stanford crime family. Agents ask V.C. what happened to his hand. And he says he had an accident with his barbecue grill. Yeah, with his barbecue grill. <laughs> his hand was burned when he spilled lighter fluid. V.C. insists the burn was an accident. He says he knows nothing about the murder of Michael Changlini and the shooting of Joey Merlino. But when investigators check out the grill, they discover it runs on propane, which conflicts with Vesey's story that he was using lighter fluid when he burned himself. It aroused our suspicion and kind of uh, pointed us toward Vesey more so than anybody else. The FBI suspects two members of the John Stanford crime family in the murder of Michael Changlini and the shooting of young Turk boss Joey Merlino. But before the FBI can bring the shooters to justice, Joey Merlino and the young Turks try to get their own revenge. John Stanford is riding in a 1976 Cadillac Seville. He's headed south on the Schuylkill Expressway with his son Joseph and a trusted driver. A van pulls up next to the Cadillac. Two gunmen thrust nine millimeter machine pistols through portholes cut in the side of the van, and they open fire. A full scale mafia civil war rages on the streets of Philadelphia. Violence explodes with a brazen rush hour attack on Sicilian mob boss John Stanford. The gunfire misses John Stanford, but his son Joseph is hit in the face. Stanford's driver rams the van, forcing it off the highway. What was really brazen about it was on a highway like that, random shots could have struck and hurt, even killed any, any innocent people who were on there. Investigators have no doubt the attack on Stanford is Joey Merlino's revenge for the murder of Michael Changlini. Showed you the extent of the uh, violence these people were willing to employ and uh, the grudge they bore against uh, Stanford. Police find Stanford at the hospital. Despite the brazen attack on him and his innocent young son, the Cosa Nostra boss claims he has no idea who tried to kill them. And of course, it's the old, I don't know who would have done this to me. And we don't get anything out of him. It is only a matter of time before innocent civilians get caught in the crossfire. And it's time to turn up the heat on the warring mob. Any known Stanford or Merlino associate seen driving around South Philadelphia becomes the subject of a routine traffic stop. Authorities arrest eight mobsters for carrying weapons. 
they confiscate 380, 45, and 38 caliber semi-automatics. The FBI has no doubt the Young Turks boss ordered the hit on John Stanford, but feds can't prove it. Joey Merlino has to be yanked off the streets. The FBI arrests him for a parole violation of a 1990 armored truck robbery. With Joey Merlino off the streets, it is now time for the FBI to focus its sights on John Stanford's crew. The agents target murder suspect John Vesey. The professional hitman is one of John Stanford's soldiers. But tonight, thanks to a New Jersey firearms violation and the threat of a long jail sentence, Vesey has agreed to wear a wire for the FBI. He was a very tough, tough individual. And he did some construction work as a hired laborer for uh, John Stanford's brother-in-law, who was in construction. And he caught the eye of Stanford, and Stanford and, uh, realized this kid was a tough kid, and he could, you know, he, he intimidated people. Under Stanford, V.C. became a loan collector, an enforcer, and a killer. Okay. Now he claims he feels the weight of the murders he committed. All these things, plus the fact that his brother, uh, who really cared for him, was convinced that uh, John was going to go down and never see the light of day. His brother convinced him that he should cooperate. Vesey was made into the family by John Stanford. And now he wants to get out alive. There is no way out, guys. So obviously it's either you get out by dying or you cooperate and try to give another life for yourself uh, with the government versus going to prison for the rest. So it doesn't really have a choice here. You couldn't measure the significance of it, but it was, uh, uh, it was like a coup for us that he came on board. V.C. quickly becomes comfortable wearing the wire. He has several meetings, but the conversations don't provide any new evidence against John Stanfa. He's out for a little while. He, I think he met with one or two people, nothing great. He was a little... He was a little down about the fact that he wasn't getting the conversations, you know, he wanted to. He was really into it. We told him, look, don't worry about it. You know, we got a lot of time. We'll do it again till we get it right. You know, it's Friday night now. You know, you've worked long and hard for us. Go home. Go home and uh, relax. Don't go out. We'll hook up with you again. We'll do it again. Later that night, John Vesey runs out of luck, and the FBI's organized crime task force is dealt a crippling blow. In a bloody South Philadelphia mob war, the FBI's number one informant is gunned down by mafia hitmen, and the FBI's best chance at busting up a notorious crime family is shattered. FBI Special Agent Fred Walls is devastated by the news that informant John Vesey has been shot. That's the fucking worst, guys. When your informant gets hit or killed or attacked or whatever, that immediately puts the investigation in a bad spot because now you got away. Okay, I can't put the guy back in because obviously they know he's involved or his life is in danger. And I've pretty much been stonewalled in my investigation. So it's a bad look all around anytime an informant gets uh, attacked. Guys, remember this is uh, this was back in the early 90s, yes. mid 90s, late 90s. So th all these people were like being investigated by RICO charges for RICO charges. Sorry. Yes. So yeah. Well, when you hear that someone's been shot in the head, you think the worst. But against all odds, after three 22 caliber slugs slammed into his skull, John Vesey is still alive. I'm shocked. This guy was shot in the head. He's given an interview. And he proceeds to tell what happened. Earlier that night, after he removed the wire and the FBI agents went home, Vesey ran into John Stanford's underboss and one of his soldiers. I know a nice place. And they tell him, we've been looking for you. We want to uh, get you started in your own bookmaking operation. We're going to show you how to do it. 
we're going to go over to this location in South Philadelphia above this meat store. For Visi, it was just another late night business meeting. He wasn't wearing the wire anymore, and he thought he had nothing to fear. He says he goes up to the room. The main guy is sitting down with him at a table, going over figures, telling him how to take bets, how to write stuff down. The underboss excused himself. He has to go to the bathroom. John Vesey heard the sound of the flushing toilet and the door to the bathroom opening. And then he heard the gunshots. Three 22 caliber slugs impacted John Vesey's skull, but he didn't go down. Vesey. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yo. And just so you guys know, 22 caliber is a small caliber, uh, but three to hit him and he's still up? Crazy. Turns around, looks at the guy and says, what the frig are you doing? And of course, the, the shooter now, he's, he's in shock. So he throws the gun down and he pulls out a knife. Well, VZ takes the knife away from him and cuts him and basically incapacitates him and throws him on the ground. Wow. He turns to the uh, okay. other guy, the main guy, who's an older guy. And the guy looks at him and he says, John, John, he said, this has all been a mis mistake. It's a, a misunderstanding. We're gentlemen here. We can settle this. And VZ says, get out of the way or I'm going to take you down too. And against all. Yo, if he wasn't an informant, guys, he probably would have killed him. I'll tell you all that. Like if you probably wasn't working for the FBI at that point, he probably would have killed them. But John VZ walks out of the room alive. And uh, that just goes to show you how tough this kid was. I mean, he was tough. And uh, the bullets went into the back of his head. And uh, we later found out they had hit the head and come around. Okay. I guess the slugs weren't as strong. It was a 22 caliber, cal 22 caliber long rifle slug. And he took three in the head and survived. Wow. Two weeks later. I'll tell you this, that's going to definitely be evidence right there. <laughs> Mafia hitman John Vesey makes his first appearance before the federal grand jury and testifies against his former crime family. The information he provides is invaluable to the FBI. Vesey names names and gives the FBI... At this point, he doesn't give a fuck. They try to kill him. ...what they need to move against the Philadelphia mob. When the FBI increases the pressure, other mobsters make deals with the prosecutors and become informants for the FBI. And the dominoes begin to fall. On St. Patrick's Day... Yeah, once you get a high-level guy to cooperate, the rest of them have not, nowhere to run, man. In 1994, 24 suspects are arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. Among those arrested is Frank Martinez. He's found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. Vincent Pagano is also arrested and found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. On the same day, John Stanford is arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. They got him with that arson for burning the, the car. It was a, a nice, clean, easy sweep. We brought the people in, and uh, we were very satisfied with it. Ultimately, 27 people are charged with conspiracy and racketeering under the RICO Act. There we go. 24 defendants yeah. are either convicted or plead guilty to the charges. And mind you guys, keep in mind that they had indicted a bunch of them uh, in New York in the mid 80s. Uh, so it would just make sense that they'd go after the Philadelphia guys next. I felt pretty good that we did make Philadelphia a little bit safer. Uh, it's it was my job. Uh, it was my life's work. Um, I thought we did a good job and I thought the, 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 that we served the citizenry very well with what we did. We took a, a very, very violent group. Uh, and sent a lot of them to jail for a long, long time. And we made Philadelphia a little safer. On July 9th, 1996, 
John Stanfa is sentenced to five consecutive life terms. He is serving them at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. Yeah, he's probably dead by now. Uh, let me see, John Stanfa. Uh, let me go. Let's see here, guys, if we can find him. Uh, We're done with the documentary. Yeah, we are. Guys, um, the Philly mob. Hold on one second. Let me was put you um. On here. Go ahead. Was like a uh, huge. Uh, I mean, they were the main leaders of the gambling businesses in Atlantic City in the mid nineties. Uh, the mid nineties. Also, uh, actually, um, the the five families because they were making these huge, like these huge amounts of money because of the gambling in Atlantic City. Uh, the economy of Atlantic City was just going like up, right? So the five families of New York they wanted like their own cut because remember the five families were the, like the most powerful family in in like at the moment. Well, they were always the the, the most powerful ones, but they wanted their own cut. Uh, from of Atlantic City uh, uh, business, right? But they didn't, I mean, they couldn't go to Philadelphia without um, the boss permission. So, of course, they never went to get it. They were never going to give him the, the permission to go to Philadelphia. Here he is, because... right here, guys. Uh, John John Stanford, right here. Um, found him. John Stanford, register number 18048 037. He's at uh Schugel, uh he's 82 years old here this is in philadelphia if i'm not mistaken yeah interstate yeah minersville pennsylvania uh fci Schugel. it's pronounced Schugel, which is the river in philadelphia um a, men, a medium security federal correctional is uh, a correctional institution with an adjacent minimum security satellite camp so yeah i mean he's he's living decent you know medium security um and you know release date he's in there for life as y'all know so yeah that's where he currently is right now. Uh, here's his Wikipedia page right here. I had it. Uh, bam, right here. Here is John, John Stanfa. Giovanni John Stanfa is an Italian, Italian-born uh, American former boss of Philadelphia crime family from 91 to 95, convicted of multiple charges in 95. Stanfa was stand, sentenced to life in prison. So, uh, yeah, cool. So, guys, that covers the Philly mob um, part of this case. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that. We gave you a lot of sauce on how the DA operates, how wiretaps work. Um, this is a longer broadcast than normal for a Thursday show, but don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Andrew, you got anything for the people? Um, no, I'm really happy how this one came out because you gave a lot of sauce of like how you worked in the HSI and like the law enforcement's like Intel. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this one. It was cool. pretty cool. All yeah, right, that was, guys. That was about it. Thank you so much for watching. We obviously uh, really appreciate it. Don't forget to like the video again, guys. Get the engagement up. We'll catch you guys on the next episode of Fed Reacts. Love y'all. Peace. A special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Okay, guys. HSI. This is what Fed Reacts covers. Defender Jeffrey Williams and Associate Weissel did commit the felony. So here's what 6 9 actually got. Magatier conspiracy. This attack shifted the whole U.S. government. This guy got arrested. Espionage. Okay. Trading secrets with the Russians. John Wayne Gacy, a.k.a. the Killer Clown. Okay. One of the most prolific serial killers of all time. Killed 33 people. Zodiac Killer is a pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who operated in Northern California. All these serial killers, guys, they really get off on getting attention from the media. Many years, Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploited 